Hello everyone, welcome to today's new starter. Let us begin with a practice question for prelims. There was a very good article in the Hindu today. So it would be better if you know the important uh, chemicals, preservatives or coloring agents that are used in uh, foods regularly. So five chemical agents are provided here. Tartrazine, Rhodamine B, Sunset Yellow, Carmacine and Matcha. Matcha is actually a green colored tea which is produced in Eastern Asian countries such as China and Japan. So this is a natural agent. If you look at the question very, very carefully, uh, they have provided which among the below mentioned chemicals are considered to be harmful and used in food coloring. That's all. They have not told uh, whether it is permitted or not permitted because in some countries uh, these agents are permitted. In some countries they are not permitted. So I don't think you might get a question upon it, but it would be better at least to know if they give a set of chemicals, you should be able to identify which among them are coloring agents. So in this, matcha will not be coming and uh, it will be 1, 2, 3 and 4. Let's start with the topic of the day, Competition Commission of India. Competition Commission of India is extremely important when it comes to prelims. In GS3, uh, we have the intellectual property rights as a topic. So Competition Commission of India is one commission which uh, tries to uh, uphold the rights of individuals or rights of companies uh, when it comes to intellectual property rights and several other uh, rights also. It tries to regulate the market by preventing monopoly, etc. So we need to know about it very clearly. The first and foremost point for prelims it is a statutory body. When it comes to Competition Commission of India, you need to immediately remember the Competition Act of 2002. It is based on this act. The Competition, of Com Competition Commission of India was created and it is a statutory body. It has one chairperson and six members and they are appointed by the central government of India. There is no specific appointment committee or panel or anything. They are just appointed by the central government of India and it has one chairman and six members. The qualification to be appointed as a member or a chairperson is that that person should match with the qualification of a high court judge or he or she should be having specific special knowledge as and professional experience of not less than 15 years in international trade, economy, business, uh, intellectual property, etc. A list is there, uh, but everything that is related to economy. So such a person should be having professional experience and special knowledge for at least 15 years in these fields so that he or she can be appointed or they should satisfy the qualification of a high court judge. Again, in 2002, the act was enacted, but it was amended in 2007. In this, the Competition Commission of India was established and the Competition Appellate Tribunal have been established. Competition Appellate Tribunal, if the Competition Commission of India gives out certain verdict and um, someone has to appeal against it. They do not have to go to the high court or any other court. They can directly go to the tribunal and the tribunal will take very less time to address the issue. The commission is a quasi-judicial body. Earlier, Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act 1969 was there and when the Competition Act 2002 came into being, this act was repealed completely. The committee which recommended the formation of competition uh, commission in India is Raghavan Committee. Try to remember that also. Let us take a look at some of the important functions. The functions of uh, Competition Commission of India. Uh, five important functions are provided here. Let's take a look at it and later we'll come to these two points. 
to eliminate the practices having adverse effect on competition that is anything related to monopoly or if anyone is trying to uh, act which is against the spirit of competition they will take care of it they protect the interest of consumers that is the most important point ensure freedom of trade in the markets of india to give opinion on competition issues so when any statutory authority asks for a opinion the competition commission of india gives their opinion competition advocacy public awareness training etc will be done in they implement the competition policies and the aim is to effectuate the most efficient utilization of economic resources these are the basic functions uh, it might not be that much important from prelims point of view but for mains it is very important so try to remember it and note it down apart from this what two important points you need to know the competition act prohibits anti competitive agreements and abuse of dominant position by enterprises let's say for example if a very big industry is there and it is trying to take some policies which will be against small players so such things will not be tolerated and the government replaced the competition appellate tribunal with national company law appellate tribunal in 2017 i told you that the competition act created the competition appellate tribunal but in 2017 what the government did is they created the national company law appellate tribunal it's not that it, it is not the national company uh, law tribunal that is different this is national company law appellate tribunal so now the competition appellate tribunal has been removed and we have the national company law appellate tribunal which will take care of anything that is related to competition commission of india and its decisions when it comes to ethics whatever topic is there in the news which is discussed in a wider manner you should know the ethical point of view you should know the ethical perspective too so when we talk about the electoral bond scheme what are all the points which you can note down from the ethical perspective for a law to be good it should follow certain basic tenets or basic values the values are it should not be ambiguous it should be very clear there should not be multiple interpretation to it that's one thing it should be easily enforceable the law should be predictable there should not be any unpredictability in the law and there should be proper accountability so these are all the basic tenets tenets which a law should follow when we talk about the electoral bonds anyways it we cannot defend it because the supreme court has clearly repealed it so we can try to collect certain points which is against the electoral bond scheme first thing transparency in funding political parties is very important to uphold the democracy of the country and to manage neutrality in elections so this particular scheme was against transparency because we cannot get the names of the companies who are contributing we cannot get the names of the individuals it is completely anonymous so it is vital to the system of free and fair election transparency is vital to the system of free and fair election and this was breached uh, in this scheme second unequal treatment of individuals so what is this provision there was a provision that if the contribution is less than 20000 it did not require the disclosure of identity less than 20000 can easily be contributed only if it is more than that you need to get an electoral bond and you need to give your identity to the state bank of india so this is against the uh, value of equality it is against the value of the constitution of india also again assumptive in nature in electoral bond scheme the basic assumption is that because the money is coming from the bank account of a person or a corporate to another bank account that is the state bank of india and from there it is going to the account of the party so because everything happens in an official way we think that it is good money it is not a black money but it is just an assumption a person who is talented enough can make or launder the black money into white money very easily we all study about it in money laundering topic so it is based on based on an assumption and a law cannot work based on assumption it should be based on proper clear cut clarity 
and evidence. So this is against the spirit of ethics. Question of legitimacy. Many purchasers bought bonds that seem to be disproportionate to their business. A business of 50 crore uh, overall turnover, getting 500 crore worth of electoral bonds clearly shows that there is no legitimacy here. There is a question of legitimacy, which is against the spirit of the democracy. Apart from that, when we talk about democracy, the fundamental idea behind democracy is utilitarianism, that is highest good for highest number of people. Here, when we take a point to defend the electoral bond scheme, we always tell that a person's uh, political allegiance or alliance is up to him. It is very personal. It should not be known outside. So whatever contribution he is doing, it is it should be behind the doors. It should uh, be completely uh, non-transparent. But in a democracy, the basic idea is that parties should work for you, work for the betterment of the people. So whoever is contributing to the parties, it should be known because there can be collusion between uh, the businessmen and the politicians, which should be avoided. Businessmen and uh, political parties having partnership will result in crony capitalism, which is against the spirit of democracy again. So this point cannot be told. In. We cannot defend that there should be uh, opaqueness about the identity of the uh, member who is contributing to a political party. Everything should be disclosed outrightly and there should be complete transparency. So there is no way we can defend the scheme from ethical point of view. Guinea worm disease. Today there was a very nice editorial about guinea worm disease and uh, this has been in news multiple times. So we need to have a clear-cut idea about it. Uh, disease has always been a favorite topic of UPSC and especially after the COVID-19. Any disease that comes in news, we need to have a clear idea about it. Guinea worm disease is going to be completely eradicated worldwide not just in a specific country, all over the world it is going to be eradicated, which is a great uh, step forward. It is not the first disease to be completely eradicated. Already we have eradicated smallpox, so this is the second disease. The guinea worm disease is also known as draconculiasis, and it is a parasitic infection caused by draconculus medinensis worm. The name of the worm should also be remembered. It is a worm. It's not bacterial. It is not a viral. It is caused by a small worm. So what happens is this worm spreads through drinking water. This disease was mostly prevalent in Africa, uh, the central parts of Africa or uh, the delta regions in Africa because the worms live in water bodies, especially inland water bodies such as lakes, wells, etc. So what people do is when they consume the water without proper heating or without following a proper uh, uh, cleanliness manners, in such cases, it easily uh, gets spread to the people. It forms a layer inside your intestine and then it uh, gets spread to the throughout the body. In certain cases, what happens is the worm will start living inside the skin of the people and after a point of time, it will create a fissure on the skin and it creeps out of the skin. So it is a very dangerous disease. It causes heavy amount of burning in the skin. And so people used to go to water bodies and dip their legs or hands inside the water. When they do this, what happens is the larva of the worm comes out and it lays egg all over the water body. When again people go and consume the same water, it spreads very easily. So this was the method or the manner in which this disease was spreading. The worm takes about a year to develop into an adult. It emerges from skin, usually the lower limbs, that is the legs. And ending epidemics of malaria, tuberculosis and neglected tropical diseases by 2030 is a sustainable development goal. And it is it comes under the target 3.3. This is a point which you can use in your mains answer. Spatial computing, especially after uh, Apple released its virtual reality device, spatial computing has become extremely important. We need to at least know about the technology. 
it is useful from prelims point of view it is useful from mains point of view also any new inventions or technologies which act as a breakthrough should be studied properly so this technology allows computers to merge data from the physical world with virtual content so you put on the device and you can see all the things that are around you the physical world apart from that the augmented reality or virtual reality is also integrated into it so you can watch a tv you can watch a movie you can play games whereas at the same point you can you can take a look at the physical world also so it is a integration of the virtual world and the physical world and that's what we call as spatial computing the key word here is integration of physical world with virtual world so how does this happen it happens with the integration of camera sensor software with the physical world along with the functioning of internet of things also iot should also be included here that is internet of things so when all these things come together you can easily design spatial computing a very good example is usage of devices such as a laptop or uh, your phone without a keyboard mice or anything without even manually touching it you can use it by just giving voice command or taking a look at uh, that particular place for example apple's device work based on uh, the way you look at it so multiple screens can be open at the same time wherever you look that part will become active and the other part will become inactive so that's how it works so it is based on the idea of spatial computing users commonly interact with spatial computing applications through virtual reality headset that mirrors the physical world or mixed reality devices that overlay the data on view of the physical world virtual reality is when you put on a device into your eyes and you can just see the virtual world you cannot see the real world whereas mixed reality is when you can see the real world and you can see the virtual world also at the same time so this is the basics of this technology mains practice question of the day very simple just now we discussed about it explain the special computing spatial it's it's spatial computing it's not special computing explain the spatial computing technology which is recently seen in the news what are the possible applications of this technology what exactly is spatial technology we have discussed it in the previous slide that becomes your answer what are the possible applications it's you can you can think from multiple point of view when you think from engineering perspective you can take a look at a device or you can take a look at the engine of an automobile you can take a look at the structure you can identify the entire uh, structural process in it you can identify the entire design in it very easily if you take a look at from the biological perspective it becomes very easy to scan a person's body it is it becomes very easy to identify how to operate it is very easy to practice operations practice medicine etc in the same way you can identify multiple different fields you can study about it and you can come up with an answer also one important point from mains point of view which you can use in your answer nascom recently released a report in which it told that data and artificial intelligence can approximately add 450 to 500 billion dollars to india's gdp by 20 25 it's not even in the long term within a year it is telling that around 500 billion dollars can be added if we are investing in artificial intelligence and data security and data infrastructure so these are all the basic things which were in news today which you should be knowing study well all the best let's meet tomorrow